and founder and first executive director of the Institute for Personal Growth, a psychotherapy organization in New York, Jersey, in New Jersey, excuse me, specializing in clinical work with a sex, relationship, and gender diverse community. She is the author of the Modern Clinician's Guide to Working with LGBTQ Plus Clients, The Inclusive Psychotherapist. She's an international speaker and author of many articles on LGBTQ sexuality, transgender youth, kink, and consensual non-monogamy, as, as well as co-director of Modern Sex Therapy Institute's Transgender Mental Health Certification Program. Please welcome Dr. Margaret Nichols. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I am going to uh, uh, go off camera because there's a problem with um, uh, with the camera on my laptop. So you will hear me, but you won't see me for uh, until until we go back to the chat. So let me just do that first. Okay. All right. So um, as Adrian said, I'm a psychologist, I'm a sex therapy, I'm an author, I'm the author of this book, which is pretty new. So it's pretty up to date. Um, I identify as queer. And I joke that that's because it's easier than saying that I'm a bisexual, lesbian mother who's kinky and non monogamous. But in fact, I also identify as queer because it represents uh, something that I believe, which is that there are a lot of commonalities among people who are sex, relationship, uh, or gender diverse. Um, so that's that's part of where I'm coming from. I was I have lived and worked in the gay community for over 40 years. I was in the first wave of therapists who were out therapists therapists after homosexuality was removed from the DSM in 1973. I was part of the wave of therapists that actually kind of invented gay affirmative therapy because before 1973 and before homosexuality was removed from the DSM, the, the treatment uh, for gay and lesbian clients was to try to cure them. Um, after that became unethical, nobody really knew what to do with gay and lesbian clients. It was kind of like, are they like everybody else? We don't really know. So it was a very exciting time. My colleagues and I were really just discovering some of the things that hopefully you all take for granted, like the stages of coming out and issues of working with families and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, I, in 1983, I founded the Institute for Personal Growth in New Jersey, which works with um, uh, the LGBTQ plus community. I also started the Hyacinth AIDS Foundation in the 80s, which was New Jersey's social service program for people with AIDS. Over the years, IPG expanded the same way that uh, the queer community expanded. Every time a letter got added, we developed expertise and uh, began to to uh, to work with a new sex or gender or relationship minority community. So we are now experts in not only working with lesbian, gay, bisexual, but trans for the last 15 years, we actually specialize in working with trans youth and kids, um, as well as consensual non-monogamy and people involved in the kink community. Five years ago, I retired from IPG. Uh, I have a small private practice. I do supervision and training, and I wrote this book. The other thing I want to say about myself is that I am an activist because I believe that if you're working with sex, gender, and relationship minorities, you have to be a political activist because unfortunately or unfortunately, uh, our issues become politicized in this country. Okay. Having trouble here. Okay. Um, 
I, I, I had planned on, on showing you a, a video compilation of, of uh, Gen Z, LGBTQ Gen Z TikTokers, but I realized, I, I discovered yesterday that that was, um, it, it would be a copyright violation for Pessy to show that. And so instead, I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through some of the videos that, uh, that I had included. I want to recommend that if you want to understand LGBTQ youth, which is basically Gen Z, that you should look at the social media. Um, yesterday, the Surgeon General warned us about the dangers of social media for adolescents. But today, there was an, another article in the Times asserting the fact that social media is very important um, uh, avenue of uh, connection and discovery for LGBTQ people. So, so this, what I, what I've done is uh, I took screenshots from the different videos, uh, the, uh, some TikToks, and I want to explain to you a little bit about what is happening, what these young people are saying in the videos. This person uh, uh, over here um, is very proud about the fact that Gen Z are, is the gay, gayest generation yet. And that is absolutely true. These statistics are accurate. And this young person is singing a song about being gay and it's okay and basically F you if you don't like it. These are also common TikTok themes for Gen Zers. On one side was a very moving TikTok about someone coming out to their friends and family and getting really positive responses. And the other TikTok on the other side is an image from a TikTok uh, from, uh, about the fact that they are trans and their family doesn't get it. Uh, you probably can't read that caption, but it says this song is about being trans, not having depression, being transgender. This is, these are two screenshots from a video that uh, is a very depressing trend. Gen Zers are very much aware that their um, peers are making suicide attempts at a rate much higher than the general public. And there are many TikToks like this that basically show someone six months before, three months before, a month before, a week before, and then dead, right? So this is, uh, this is a relatively mild one. It doesn't show a picture of a coffin or a horse, but there are many of these uh, on TikTok. This is a, a a TikToker who is outraged upon finding out that part of the Republican agenda, at least for some Republicans, is to make the Florida's don't gay, say gay law national. I'm assuming that you you all know what the don't gay don't say gay law is. We're going to talk in a little bit more depth about it, but it's it's a it's a scary thing for a lot of LGBTQ youth. This is, um, I, I put these screenshots up from this TikTok to illustrate the activism of queer Gen Zers. So this is a TikToker who put up a picture of uh, saying that basically millennials are fighting for civil rights by reasoning and discussion. And if you can see over here, this one, this Gen Zer has a hammer in her hand. Um, the implication being that Gen Z is, um, going to be a lot more forceful than just talking. Okay, this is a picture from a protest that a, a group of students did. They protested their college's anti-LGBTQ policy. Every student handed the president a pride flag as they received their diploma. And this is my favorite. Um, you can see that, that that on one side is a Gen Zer who is extremely enthusiastic about what they are hearing. Uh, this is a report in Florida. One of the laws in Florida now requires that if that schools notify families if there is a if their kid has come out as trans or gay. And so, at one Florida school, the way the students chose to deal with this was every single one of the students told the administration that they're gay or trans in an effort to really clog the works. Again, 
Gen Z is aware of what's going on and many of them are activists. Okay. So young queer people are very worried about what's going on in the country. This is a, a picture from a New York Times op-ed that appeared in March. Uh, this young man, Will Larkins, is a junior in high school in Winter Park, Florida. And he wrote an op-ed in response to the Florida Don't Say Gay Bill. He writes about an incident last year where he, had, he was being bullied for being gay and a supportive teacher not only stopped the bullying, but comforted him, tried to help him find some resources so he could find community. And what he says in the op-ed article is if that teacher did the same thing now after this law's been passed, she could be fired for giving the same kind of support. He also writes about um, the, the gay friends he has that only get support at school, that don't have supportive parents and the fact that having books and written materials about being gay is a resource for gay teens who can't find information about themselves other places this is another times article about the the how how parents are frantically trying to figure out how to protect their trans kids um in states where these laws are being passed or have already been passed or there's a threat that they're being passed. I've had a similar experience. I supervise uh, aspiring sex therapists all over the country. And recently, uh, a couple of months ago, in one of my groups, one of the therapists brought up a somewhat unusual case situation. She had a trans, 13-year-old uh, trans client who was on puberty blockers and she lived in Idaho and Idaho was about to pass um, an anti-affirmative care law that would make it illegal for this kid to be on puberty block blockers and mandate that the child come off puberty blockers. The therapist was extremely distraught. She said that her client had been very dysphoric, very depressed, a lot of suicidal ideation, before they were put on blockers and she feared that it was gonna happen again. She didn't know what to do. And that was an issue that we really couldn't help her with. Since that group, in fact, Idaho did pass this law and it is going to affect into effect, I think in July. Okay. Um, gender affirming clinics are being harassed, um, uh, much the way that abortion clinics have been harassed. But one of the things, the other thing that's happening that I've been reading about is doctors who do gender, who provide gender affirming medical care are quitting uh, and leaving states where there is, even before the laws go into effect, because the, in many of these states, the laws are criminalizing gender affirming care. Um, this is a picture of a CPAC speaker who called for the eradication of transgenderism. Um, imagine being transgender and hearing someone call for the elimination of what you are. It's a pretty scary thing for kids. Okay, I want to, um, I want to move on to talking about some data on LGBTQ plus youth and mental health. This is data from the Trevor uh, Project. The Trevor, I would highly recommend you, you, the, the Trevor Project as a resource. They have all kinds of resources, including chat rooms um, for trans and LGBTQ youth. And their survey is uh, the most recent and most comprehensive of, of this population. In 2022, they surveyed 34,000 LGBTQ plus youth between the ages of 13, of 13 and 24. Okay, let me give you the highlight. This is the highlights of their findings, but I wanna point out a couple of things in particular. Uh, first, this statistic that 45% of LGBTQ youth, youth uh, seriously considered suicide in the past year, that's a very high percentage. 
much higher. I mean, suicidality has been higher recently since COVID among all adolescents, but it is extremely high among LGBTQ youth and highest among transgender. And I want to, but I want to also point out that there are mitigating factors that LGBT kids who felt that their family supported them, who felt that their schools afford, uh, supported them, and or felt that their communities supported them, were much less likely to attempt suicide and have suicidal ideation than those who don't have that, that kind of support, which is one, one tip for you all as therapists that, um, and I'm going to return to this several times in this presentation, um, you need to be working with families of your queer youth clients, if you're not already. Okay. Also from the Trevor Project sur survey, between 2020 and 2022, the rates of anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation all went up among LGBTQ youth. Suicide attempts did not go up, but honestly, uh, that's just a matter of time. I think it's probably a lagging indicator. Uh, and if the trends of increased suicide, suicidal ideation and anxiety and depression continue, uh, there's no way that the suicide attempts aren't going to get higher as well. Okay. This I find a very interesting statistic in this age group, 82% of this, of the 13 to 24 year old LGBTQ young people, 82% want therapy. I find that to be an extremely high percentage in this age group because some of you who work with adolescents know that often they need to be dragged to therapy, but these kids want therapy and unfortunately, mostly they don't get it. Of the kids who want mental health care, only 60%, only 40% were able to get it, 60% were not able to get it. So one of the things that you can do to help in this situation is to go out of your way to do outreach to LGBTQ youth um, to get them into your practice. So this is another important statistic. Only 37% of LGBT, LGBTQ youth consider their homes to be affirming spaces. And 55% consider school to be affirming. That's the, the, the statistics are worth, worse if you, if you pick out just the trans and non-binary kids, even fewer of them find, find home as a affirming space and fewer find school as an affirming space. But what I really wanna point out here is that pretty much universally, these kids find school to be more affirming than homes. And what happened during COVID? Schools were shut down. Kids were trapped at home. Uh, it was a recipe for depression and anxiety to, to trap these kids in a household with uh, um, families that they consider non-affirming and non-supportive. Okay, so speaking of schools, I want to move on to the GLSEN report. GLSEN, I think they just used the acronym now. GLSEN used to, when it started, it stands for Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. It's an organization that works with schools, um, not only to do reports on schools, but also to help schools develop LGBTQ friendly um, curriculum, practices, so on and so forth. So the the uh, this is from, um, the 2022, the, the survey was released in October of 2022. This GLSEN study, a report on schools, um, showing basically that school support for LGBTQ plus students is declining, right? Four in five of these students fe reported feeling unsafe in school. Six in 10 were verbally harassed and over a third were physically harassed or assaulted. Um, and at the same time, the number of GSAs, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's Gay Straight Alliance. There's a school sanctioned clubs um, 
that gay people, gay kids can can join, and straight kids can join as well. Okay, the GS, number of GSLAs has gone down in schools, right? So, um, what I want to point out about these statistics is the number, the high percentage of kids that are missing school because they feel unsafe or uncomfortable at school, and the, the high percentage of kids that, right, 16.2% that uh, reported they had to change schools because of safety factors at school. We're doing, we've got some issues here with our schools. All right, um, the, again, more unfortunately, lack of support from schools, the percentage of, of LGBTQ plus students who had a GSA available dropped, um, and 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 there's no uh, and and least uh, and LGBTQ information in textbooks and class resource sources is is um, is not increasing. And in states like Florida, where it's being excised from the curriculum, pretty soon it, there there won't be anything in school curriculum that addresses LGBTQ students. All right, so I want to dip into why this is happening, why LGBTQ kids have higher rates of anxiety and su suicidality. This is a concept that if you don't know this concept, if you're working with any kind of stigmatized minority, you should understand the impact of minority stress, right? Minority stress is the additional stress that is experienced by members of marginalized groups, like the uh, obviously ethnic groups, racial groups, religious groups that are discriminated against, but also LGBTQ plus people. Um, sometimes this stigma gets internalized. We call that internalized homophobia, meaning that the person that's being discriminated against has somehow internalized the uh, the idea that there's something wrong with them, right? That they're less than. So we talk about internalized stigma as internalized homophobia, for example. And the other concept that I want you to to uh, relate to is the idea of courtesy stigma. Courtesy stigma is the stigma that attaches to uh, attaches you to you because someone that you're close to is a member of a stigmatized group. And the important thing about to remember about courtesy stigma is when you're working with families, often the parents are reacting to courtesy stigma. They may have never had to deal with discrimination in their life, and now they have a gay, lesbian, bi, or transgender kid, um, and they are facing stigmatization from their family, extended family, from their community, et cetera. Okay, um, I also want to give you an idea of, there's been a lot of research on minority stress, and there's been a guy named Hudson Bueller in particular, there's a lot of research on the impact of minority stress on LGBTQ people. And just to give you an idea of how impactful it is, what Hudson, Hudson Bueller studied rates of depression and anxiety in LGBTQ adults in states before or after anti-discrimination laws were passed, anti-LGBTQ discrimination laws were passed, and in states where, uh, discri where discrimination laws were either overturned or uh, discri discrimination was sanctioned, LGBTQ discrimination was sanctioned. In states where um, that passed laws outlawing discrimination against LGBTQ people in the two years following that, rates of anxiety and depression among gay people decreased. And in states that instituted discriminatory laws, rates of anxiety and depression increased in the year or two after the laws were, pa were passed. It's a vivid example of how impactful minority stress is and how impactful legislation is. Okay, so besides minority stress, there is another factor that uh, that impacts LGBTQ plus kids um, negatively, 
this is a picture of Andrew Solomon's book, Far From the Tree. He, uh, uh, the book is about children who are different from their fa the families they are born into. So many stigmatized groups, maybe most of them, share common identities with their families and their communities. For example, a black child, as horrible as racism is, most black children have parents, families, extended families, possibly church, school, community that are also black and can protect them, support them, and give them information, teach them how to navigate, can validate the stress that they're, the kid is under, and can teach them how to navigate prejudice and stigma as best can be done, right? Um, I'll give you an example of this from my own experience. My partner Nancy and I had a child in a lesbian relationship in the early 1980s, and um, we faced a lot of uh, blowback about uh, about doing that because uh, there was still gayness was still not all that accepted in the in the in the early 80s. When Corey, our, our little boy, uh, we were able to protect him because we knew what was coming. We were able to protect him. We moved to a neighborhood that was gay friendly. We sought out daycare centers and schools that would be gay friendly. So we were able to protect him as much as possible. Um, when he got old enough to understand, we were able to have conversations with him along the lines of, look, we all know that it's okay to be gay, but there's some people in the world who think it's bad and they may attack you. And so you may, you may wanna think about who you're open with and who you tell about your family. So we were able to somewhat protect him, somewhat educate him. And that's something that many uh, minority children are able to get from their parents. Contrast that with what happens with gay kids. Most of the time, gay kids are born into families where the parents are not gay. And often they're born into families where the parents aren't supportive of being gay. And so not only do these kids not get support and protection from their families, the families often become their first abuser. Okay. I want to switch now and focus a little bit more on trans kids because in terms of current legislation, they are the most frequent targets of, of this leg legislation. And they are the most frequent targets of bullying. LGBT kids in general are bullied more than other kids. Trans and non-binary kids are, are bullied most of all um, because they're visible, right? Because they're visible. Okay, so I wanna, before I get into the laws and what you can do about that, I wanna give you some important facts about trans youth. Number one, most trans adults are young, right? And there are, um, uh, trans, trans young is what I'm trying to say. So what's happening with trans people is very much like what happened with gay people after, as, as the culture became a little bit more accepting of homosexuality. Uh, by the way, I have a TEDx talk about this. It's on my website, if you're interested, where I talk about the, um, the, the, the gender explosion. Um, there has in fact been um, an uptick, a large uptick of young people identifying as trans or non-binary, just like, so, and the age of coming out is getting younger and younger. Basically, that's what happened with gay people, and that's what's happening with trans people as well. It's not really a big mystery um, why there are more trans youth. The more it gets accepted in the culture, the more they will, more trans kids will feel able to come out at younger and younger ages. Second fact here, transitioning works. Okay, this statistic, which is about 80%, is actually low. Most of the research on transitioning and transition regret shows no more than a one to two percent of detransition or regret. Uh, the vast majority of trans people who transition say that it helped them. It's uh, the biggest factor in what's helped them. 
Third thing I want to point out, which may be um, surprising to you, the large, within the trans community, the largest group are non-binary people. Six in 10 trans adults do not identify either as a trans man or as a trans woman, but are in de, uh, identify as non-binary, gender non-conforming, um, agender, all, all kinds of ways of describing themselves that, that do not conform to um, the dichotomy of male-female. That's important for you to realize because um, not all trans kids are, are even interested in medical intervention. A lot of non-binary people have no real interest in medical intervention or in changing their bodies. So it's something for you to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that you need to uh, uh, keep in mind is that there is a huge overlap. Speaking of intersectionality, there's the intersection of trans, gay, um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, kinky, and non-monogamous is, is overwhelming, right? So 70% of trans adults identify as lesbian, gay, queer, or bisexual. And there is also a very large overlap um, within, with the kink community and the community of people, mostly the polyamory community. And most trans adults realize they were transgender in childhood, um, usually under the age of 18, often under the age of 10. So keep these things in mind as you are hearing some of the crazy talk that, that, um, that, that you're going to hear from legislators who are trying to pass anti-trans care legislation. Okay. Trans and trans and non-binary young people are extremely aware of this legislation. Obviously, you can see here, over 90% of them are worried. They're worried they're not gonna get care. They're worried they're not gonna be able to go to the bathroom they need to go to. And they're, 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 they're worried about um, uh, playing sports, but they're worried about being able to get gender affirming care more than anything. All right. Let's move on to the bills a little bit and what they actually are. Um, in 2022, they were uh, 26 bills passed. 2023, this is probably, uh, this is this is a month or two old, this data, so this is probably, it's probably even worse now. 490 anti-trans bills introduced in 47 states. Um, even in New Jersey, where I live, there are six anti-trans bills that have been introduced. Now, in a state like New Jersey, those bills aren't going to go any place, but in many places, they have already passed. So let me talk a little bit about what, what the different kinds of bills are. The worst bills, in my mind, are the ones that prohibit gender-affirming care. Uh, usually medical, sometimes it's, it, they even prohibit mental health care, but usually what they're prohibiting are puberty blockers and um, cross-gender hormone treatments. I, I'm not, uh, if you are interested, if you don't understand what these things are, ask in the, uh, in the and I can answer them in the Q&A. I don't really want to, I'm going to assume that you know what puberty blockers um, and hormone therapy uh, is. Um, none of these medical practices are, uh, are, uh, are appropriate before adolescence, but in many states, it's now being banned in some cases up to the age of 26. So that's the, the most worrisome type of uh, legislation that we're dealing with. Another type uh, of the, these anti-LGBTQ bills are school-based. So a big one prohibiting trans athletes from uh, from playing on the uh, um, in gender that they are affirmed in, um, forcing teachers I, I mentioned this before to out their gay or trans students to parents, banning topics or books from classrooms. Third type of anti-LGBTQ bills being considered and passed are bathroom bills, and these are bills that say that you cannot you must use the bat, the bathroom that conforms to your biological gender think about this for a second um 
Think about Laverne Cox, for example, going to a men's room. Think about um, uh, um, uh, I'm just blank on this thing. Cher's trans son uh, um, going into a woman's bathroom. There, it, 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 it's putting trans people in tremendous danger. To, to, to do this and really what it's doing is denying trans people the access to public bathrooms. Um, another set of bills like this are the identity bills that pro prohibit trans people from up updating their gender information on their licenses and birth certificate, etc. And last but not least, prohibiting drag shows. Okay, in 19 states, Gender, I'm going to hone in on gender affirming care because it's so destructive. 19 states, the care is already banned as of May. Um, and in a bunch more, the, the yellow states are uh, have laws that are being considered. So Texas is the most recent state to ban gender affirming care, and Florida was right behind them. Okay. Besides legislation community school boards and library boards are under pressure to ban books so this book um and tango makes three it's a depiction of a true event a male penguin couple in the central park zoo were given a penguin egg and they hatched the egg and raised a chick and somebody wrote a book about it and it's now being banned in florida this book was banned, has been, is another uh, book that's being challenged. This book was challenged near me in a town called Glen Ridge in New Jersey. The author of this book lives in Plainfield, New Jersey. Uh, it's a memoir. This is a young adult book and it's his memoir. Um, six books were challenged in Glen Ridge. All of them had LGBTQ comment. They interviewed um, George Johnson, the author of this book about it, and this is what he said. It's a sad day when people have decided that the banning of books, which has not killed a single student, is more important than the banning of guns. As a black queer person, I know what it's like to read books that don't tell my story. So in this hunt to, quote, protect teens, unquote, does it ever cross your mind that removing or restricting this life-saving story for LGBTQ students only harms the, them more, or how removing this life-saving story for Black teens harms them more. So this book has been the worst year ever for book bannings, and it's actually, um, it's something, even if you're in a state that isn't like Jersey, that isn't going to pass um, anti-trans legislation, in many communities, there are book there are there are uh, book challenges, and that's something that you can do locally as an activist: is be aware of what's happening in your local school board and your local libraries. Okay. Um, every major healthcare organization, mental health care organization, an organization that deals with. Um, uh, transgender people has condemned these laws. The American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, uh, the the American uh, Association of P Pediatricians, WPATH, World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and the U.S. branch of that, all have condemned this gender affirming, the bans on, on gender affirming health care doesn't seem to be making much of a difference. Um, what's been happening is that there are some far right think tank tanks that have basically written laws that are like cookie cutter laws that can be um, that can be uh, passed any place. And and then these uh, people from these conservative organizations are going around to the most conservative legislators in every state and asking them to introduce it. They have a group of so-called experts that will testify. They have a couple of 
uh, young people that have detransitioned that will testify and they they sort of just bring the dog and pony show all around the country in order to try to push this legislation. Okay, so by now, I have hopefully have convinced you um, that there's a problem, that there is a big problem. Not only that there's a problem with the legislation, but that there is a, but that the, the, the legislation, the attempts to pass this legislation are having a very negative effect on the mental health and well being of LGBTQ young people. So I want to say, for those of you who may be wondering about this, I don't want to maintain that there are no problems at all with gender affirming care. What's happened in the last 20 years is that the, the number of trans and non binary kids and adolescents has really just mushroomed. Um, and, and it has been impossible for providers to keep pace with that. What I mean by that is most of you as providers, if you were taught anything about trans people in, um, in, in graduate school, it was that it was a mental illness, right? It's only been very recently the American Psychiatric Association has loosened up on the definition of, of um, gender dysphoria and acknowledge that um, there's nothing pathological about having um, an atypical gender presentation or gender identity. So most of you probably were taught that transsexualism, quote unquote, is a disease and that it's, uh, and it's a disease that should be cured or at least prevented. And in fact, up until really maybe 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, the only therapy available for gender non-conforming kids mm -hmm. was a terrible therapy that is sometimes called throw away the Barbies. Um, it was a therapy that basically could a conversion therapy for children, um, forcing gender non-conforming to kids to, if they were uh, uh, assigned male at birth, and, and like playing with dolls, throw away the B Barbies, don't let the kid play with dolls, don't let the kid wear female clothes, primary colors, sports, uh, push that kid to be, to conform to male stereotypes. That was basically the treatment up until 20 years ago. And so most of you really haven't progressed beyond that because you haven't gotten the training. Um, so you, you you don't really so you don't really understand um, other ways of dealing with gender nonconformity in children because the number of trans and non-binary kids has mushroomed so rapidly. Providers have not been able to keep up the pace in terms of their own learning, research, uh, best practices, etc. And when anything expands this rapidly, I mean, I'll give you an example. At IPG, we got our first, I've been working with trans people ever since the 80s, because when I was trained as, as a sex therapist, I was trained in, to, to, to work with transgender adults as well. Um, up until the 90s at IPG, we, all the transgender people, that clients that we got were middle-aged. In the 90s, we started to get college students that, that identified as transgender. In 2007, we had our first three-year-old and our first 12-year-old um, uh, clients that were presented as transgender. And for a, and we and ever since then, um, we would get initially a you know a couple of kids a month. We now get hundreds of trans and non-binary clients asking for therapy per year, hundreds of them. So when you have a population that's exploded that much, it's very difficult to keep up um, uh, to keep up in terms of learning how to deal with the population. So all of this is to say that there are undoubtedly some problems. Um, there's some sloppiness. I hear 
things that scare me about incomplete assessments of children and so on and so forth. But it's not, number one, it's not the most common thing, right? There are undoubtedly mistakes being made, but they're not that common. And number two, these are issues that really need to be dealt with by medical and mental health professionals. Putting this in the hand of legislators is, is terrifying to me. Um, anyway, so let's talk a little bit about what you can do to help. First thing is, I mentioned this before, you have to work with the families. Um, if you are working with children, you're probably already working with families. A lot of people who work with adolescents don't necessarily work with parents. With trans adolescents, you have to work with the parents. And if, and if you're not the one working with the parents, you have to have a, a, a colleague working with the parents because the single biggest thing you can do to help a, 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 a trans, any LGBTQ, but especially trans adolescent, is get that family to be supportive. Now, what's on the screen here? You have this in, um, as, as one of your handouts for um, this session. This is a poster that's produced by an organization called the um, uh, Family Acceptance Project. Um, I, I put the URL on this slide. And it's a poster that is intended for parents. I would um, I would urge you to make copies of it and keep it in your waiting room and give it to and give it out to parents. And this is a this is a poster that shows the positive things that family can families can do um, to uh, to help their kids. Um, Many of these things are pretty obvious, right? So they, it says things like you support your child, gender expression, even if you don't understand it. You talk with your kid, you're accepting. Um, you don't tell the kid that they're, that, you know, that they're going to be punished by God. You, you don't, you welcome their friends in the home. You, you help them establish connections with other LGBTQ kids. Uh, you don't belittle them. To me, these are fairly obvious things, not necessarily obvious to parents. Stand up for your kid, with, to your other family members. Stand up for your kid in your community, in your church, um, at the school. These are all important things for parents to do. Again, they may seem obvious to you, not necessarily obvious to parents. Family Acceptance Project also publishes this poster um that tries in a non fairly non-confrontative way to list the behaviors that parents can uh, can engage in that hurt their children um so obviously don't belittle the kid don't shame the kid don't criticize them don't tell them to, you know don't don't kick them out uh, a horrifying number of trans kids are actually kicked out of their home when they come out to their parents, which is another reason why it's dangerous to have schools um, outing kids to, to families. Um, don't keep them from, uh, from, from LGBTQ friends. Don't keep them from LGBTQ resources, particularly online resources. Those online resources, depending on what part of the country you live in, the online resources may be the only resources that, um, that the child has okay so i've sort of summarized what you can do with families what you need to 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 help them around to let me stop for a second and say if you work with trans teens there may be a counter transference issue that goes on because i've noticed that that, that you know a lot of therapists who are working with trans teens get very protective of the teens and get angry at the parents for not being supportive. If that's the case, then have a colleague see the parents. Because what I try to tell uh, therapists, but also even tell trans teens, is it takes parents a while. Don't expect to come out to a parent that as trans and have that parent be immediately accepting. It may take them a while to do it. So. In general, this is what you're trying to help you, the parents do. Help them accept their kid, reassure them that they're still loved, be affectionate, 
with them, you know, reassure them that they're proud of them, that they're, they think they're terrific. Talk to them respectfully, use their pronouns. You may slip and, and preferred name. You may slip up, you slip up, you apologize, you try more the, the next time. Educate yourself as a parent. The kid probably doesn't need that much education. They probably know more than their therapist about being trans. You need to educate yourself. Um, stand up for your kid, welcome their friends, and find support groups for the child and for yourself. An invaluable resource is PFLAG. PFLAG um, stands for Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. Um, it's, it's, the organization is probably about 40 years old, and there's chapters all over the world. Find your local PFLAG chapter. These days, most of the parents that go to PFLAG meetings are there to, to be supported and get information about their trans kids, not about their gay kids. So it's a really invaluable resource for parents. It's very helpful for parents to, um, to be able to talk to other parents and have their concerns validated, right? So parents don't need to be told, you know, just get with the program. Parents need to understand that the fears they have are pretty normal. The, the, the concerns they have for their kids are pretty normal concerns. Um, and only when their concerns are that validated are they often able to move on and become more supportive. Okay. Uh, you want Wanna, uh, this again, this sort of goes without saying. You want to encourage your families to avoid belittling their children, blaming them, preventing them from having access to peer, LGBTQ peers. Don't tell them God's going to punish them. Don't pressure them to look different or act different. Don't try to. Don't send them to conversion therapy. Um, it's against the law in many states now. But even if it isn't, don't send them to conversion. And, 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 and don't fail to protect them from bullies. And don't be a bully yourself. Okay, let's move on in the final few minutes here uh, to talk about what you can do as a therapist. The first thing you need to do is you need to get yourself trained, especially in trans affirmative care. So um, if you don't know much about working with LGBTQ youth you need to get some specialized training in particular because none of the training that you got in graduate school is going to be relevant for your trans youth you need to get specialized training in the area of trans affirmative care uh, i'm going to give you some resources for that in a little bit um, try to make yourself accept, ex uh, accessible accessible to lgbtq youth if you can reduce fees for some clients, that's great. But even if you can't, get in touch with the LGBTQ center nearest you and tell them that you are um, queer affirming as a therapist and that you are happy to accept referrals of uh, LGBTQ plus youth. Find ways in your office to signal that you're an ally, right? Um, you can have you can do that by keeping some of the posters that I just showed you in your office, uh, by keeping books about trans or gay issues in your office, uh, maybe a little rainbow flag, something in your office so that visually when someone enters your office, they can tell that you're an ally. That would be a wonderful thing to do. Um, another thing that you should do, I would recommend you do this with all your clients uh, so that your trans clients don't feel singled out. On the IPG paperwork and on the paperwork that I use for new clients, I ask uh, for your legal name and your preferred name, your legal gender and your affirmed gender, uh, and what pronouns you prefer. Um, I should have said mine at the beginning, she, her, hers. Um, do that for all your clients. Your non-trans clients will barely notice. Your trans clients will notice, your queer clients will notice immediately. And it, it's a signal that you're an ally and a signal that you know what you're talking about. Work with the parents and family. Uh, I, I've already talked a lot about that. Um, advocate 
for clients with schools. Um, a year or two ago, one of the uh, uh, another therapist and I did a did an information a psychoeducation session at a Jersey City elementary school for the parents of the classmates of a kid that was transitioning. Um, the, the school was very smart in doing this. They were afraid that the parents of, of the kid's classmates, because this is a child that had gone to um, kindergarten and first grade as, uh, as a boy and was transitioning to female in second grade. Um, so the school was worried that the, obviously the parents of the classmates were going to know, and they were worried about getting blowback from the parents. And so they preemptively had us come in and do a psychoeducational session for the parents and explain everything they wanted to know about, uh, about trans kids. Um, the transition went seamlessly. It was a smart thing to do. I have many times called schools, talked to guidance counselors, talked to principals, reminded them of um, what they're legally obliged to do for trans kids. Um, in most states now, schools are obliged to use the name and pronouns of a, and it is in the states where they're, with, with this anti-trans legislation, this is not true, but in most states now, schools are really required to use a child's uh, uh, affirmed name and pronouns and to change it on the roster, et cetera, et cetera. Know what the school policy in your state is and advocate for your clients with schools. Um, if you can do it, do the kind of psychoeducation that I've just talked about. I've been to many community organizations, parent groups, et cetera, uh, talking about this issue um, because, because part of the Part of the way that this legislation has been allowed to grow and and, um, and 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 blossom into the nightmare that it has is because of the widespread ignorance of the population in general about trans and non-binary kids. So, whatever you can do to educate, absolutely do that. Contact legislators. I'll have a one little caveat here. If you're going to contact your legislator. Um, I would get in touch with whatever, uh, in, mo in most states, there is at least one pride organization that does advocacy and legal work. Um, in New Jersey, it's Garden State Equality. And so when I realized that there were six anti-trans laws in the legislature, I got in touch with Garden State Equality, spoke to them. They actually said, don't contact legislat legislators because we don't think these bills are even going to get out of committee and we're not trying to not draw attention to them um but my point is do something about the legislature be aware of the legislation talk to whatever um groups are advocating might be the aclu advocating in your state for queer youth and follow their lead in in, in what you can do many of them are going to tell you to go to school board meetings because that's where a lot of the action is happening now at school board meetings Finally, um, donate to appropriate advocacy and support groups if you can afford to do it. Um, okay, so let me just mention in the last couple of minutes a couple of places you can get training, right? The ASEC, um, the members of A, which is the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, ASEC routinely um uh asec members routinely present webinars on lgbtq plus topics i did uh, uh I, 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 as an asec provider um trainer i've done trainings on every lgbtq topic you can imagine um, i just did a four-hour webinar on consensual non-monogamy um so look at look up asec and see what is being offered through asec Modern Sex Therapy Institutes is a CEU um, and PhD granting uh, organization. They have certification programs in LGBTQ affirmative care and a certification program on the co-director in trans affirmative care. Um, 
and they and you can also get individual webinars on topics so you don't need to get certified but for example if you're going to work with trans and non-binary youth you need to take several webinars in working with children and adolescents who are trans or non-binary. The World Professional Association, WPAP, for Transgender Health, gives workshops and has their own certification. You can look them up online and see what they have to offer. Or you can get supervision through one of these programs or through a supervisor, like ASEC supervisors usually have a lot of training in trans issues. Um, when I, in 2007, when I got the, my first 12 year old client, trans client, the first thing I did was obtain supervision from somebody I knew who had expertise in this area. So that's the other thing that you can do. And I think you have, you will have this as a, as a handout, so you don't need to write any of this down. These are some important links that will be helpful for you. Um, resources for family and youth, PFLAG, Trevor Project, uh, Family Acceptance Project, etc. And you can find other resources on my website, or you can contact me for training or, uh, and supervision, or just to ask questions. And I think I've come in pretty much exactly on time. So I am going to unshare Great timing, Dr. Nichols. If you want to, we're gonna try and um, have you on camera and see that. if that works. And I, I think we're, we might be okay with, if you're comfortable. Sure. We have lots and lots of questions. I'm just gonna get to as many as I possibly can. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, first, the minority stress model has been subject to some critiques over the past couple of decades. I'm sure that you know, you've heard of those conversations or been a part of those conversations, just being more of a deficit based type model and not really directing attention enough to the actual problems, such as heterosexism, for example. Um, can you speak to how you help with your clients or their families kind of shift away from seeing themselves as the problem and direct attention to what the problem actually is? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I would say that I do a lot of education with my clients and my parents, um, and not necessarily talking about minority stress per se, but talking about prejudice and stigma and the burdens that that um, th that that puts on on um, on young people in particular. Um, I'm not sure if that's what this person was looking for, but that's all I got for now. Yeah, I mean, it just sounds like you're saying you, you don't, you're not focusing solely on the minority stress element, but no, bringing in all. all the context into your practice as well. Uh, exactly, including yeah. emphasizing the resources that are available. Yeah. What, you know, you talk a lot about the political events that are happening, and we're all living in that right now. Um, what are some of the clinical issues that you see about how those political attacks are affecting the lgbtq plus community and the clients in session like how does that show up in clinical work and what are some strategies about how to handle that okay so i mean sometimes it shows up um very obviously for example um one of my supervisees talked about a trans client of hers who had worked very hard um, to get a, a coveted internship in marine biology um, and turned it down because it was in Texas. And she was terrified to go to Texas. Uh, uh, we're, I'm here, we're hearing a lot of that, of people being afraid to travel to states that are non-affirming, um, people who had dealt with anxiety disorders and now the anxiety is flaring up again. Um, it, 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 those are the kinds of issues. Now, some of it, there's not a damn thing you can do. I mean, with the with a young person who didn't want to go to Texas, I'm certainly not going to urge that person to go to Texas. Um, I think it would. I, I think I think activism helps clients a lot. So one of the things that I try to do when if it's if it's 
um, at all possible is to hook clients up with organizations who are who are worried with organizations that are that are doing something about this because it makes people feel more empowered if they feel that they're doing something. It's that whole trauma model of you know if you're helpless, you're you're much more likely to be traumatized than if you have some way to fight to fight back. Thank you. We've had, I've had, this question has, has shown up in all the sessions and I'm starting to see it um, kind of as a theme, no matter what the speakers are talking about, there seems to be this stuck point for clinicians about parents. And we wanna encourage parents, we wanna be supportive of our, of our LGBTQ plus youth. And the question really is kind of centering around what if the parents are just never going to move along that development that they hope they will when they are provided education, resources, et cetera, that we're able to provide them? And they're just non-affirming and it doesn't appear that that's gonna change. How do you help clients? How do you respond to parents like that? And how do you help clients who are in that situation? Okay, so first off, I would say never is a long time. And I, I, I mean, I tend to be an optimist anyway, but I rarely assume that a parent is never going to change. Um, I, uh, but but when I when I have parents that are unsupportive, I work with the hopefully adolescent because it's really hard with younger kids. But uh, in terms of understanding, I I I talk to the adolescent along a couple different lines. One thing is I tend to say to them, okay, how long did it take you? to work this out inside yourself and feel okay about yourself and feel okay about coming out. How long did that take you? Probably took you a long time. Why would it take your parents any less time? Um, so, you know, I try to, I, I try to encourage adolescents to, to be patient, basically. Um, I also try to explain to adolescents, it's a little hard to understand, but I believe this, even unsupportive parents, are coming from, usually coming from a place of love, right? They just really believe that their child is in danger if their kid's gay. Now, I mean, look, this isn't true of all parents. I mean, they're, they're jerks, you know, they're parents that are jerks. But a lot of the parents that are unsupportive are unsupportive because they're frightened. And you know, I try to work with the parents around that fear, but I also try to explain to the adolescents that their parents are looking. I know it doesn't look like this to you, but the parent, your 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 mom, your dad, they're frightened for you. Um, try to expose the parents. I mean, it's helpful if you can do this. Expose the parents to adults who are LGBTQ living normal lives, because a lot of the fears of parents are, oh, my my kid is now doomed to a life of loneliness and bullying and harassment and so on and so because they don't know because the parents don't know healthy queer adults so that's another thing you can do and if all else fails you just have to take with that kid the attitude of you're in prison when you're 18 you can get out let's help you figure out how you can cope with this until you can get out Thank you. Do you have strategies, so, so kind of related to that, do you have strategies that help you help kids, adolescents, know if, when it's safe to come out to their family? Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I will say that by and large, I think adolescents no more than you know no more than the therapist but the problem i, I can find sometimes with, with with adolescents is they feel good about who they are and they're just dying to tell the world and they're dying to tell their parents and and often those kids need to be sort of held back and i would advise them to find indirect ways of feeling the parents out you know like uh you know put a, a put a put a show about trans people on on the tv see how your parents react to it 
Uh, bring home a book, see how your parents react to it. Some way short of you actually coming out to get some sense of how your parents feel about LGBTQ plus people. Now, having said that, there are parents who feel fine about LGBTQ plus people as long as it's not their kid. So, so that's not a fail safe strategy, but at least it can, I mean, it, 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 at least it will flag the parents that you know are going to not deal with this when they, you know, if, if they're, if they make nasty jokes about being gay or they make awful comments about a show or a piece of literature, um, you can at least flag the parents that are going to be terrible. Um, so that, that's a little bit of, of what I do. Great. Right. There's this discussion about the uh, phrase for parents grieving the loss of their transgender child. Mm -hmm. You know, there's back and forth, not just here, but just um, in the community in general about how appropriate or helpful that term is and who it centers, et cetera. What do you think about that term grieving the loss as it relates to working with parents who are you know, encountering transition from their kids with their I think, kids. I think it's realistic. I mean, I, I you know, I, I understand, I understand the objections to the phrase, but it's realistic. I've seen it over and over and over again. And it's not just trans. It's if your child, if you suddenly find out that your child is different, you know, we're going to have a different future from what you imagine. And that different future is, you know, is particularly if that different future is a future that you're worried about, you are going to grieve the loss of your dreams, right? I mean, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, this is a, a, a trivial example, but, you know, you have a daughter who doesn't want a wedding, you know, and you've imagined, a, you know, a big white wedding for all these years. I mean, Parents shouldn't pin their hopes and dreams on their kids, but, you know, I'm a parent. I got three grown kids. No matter how hard you try, you have some expectations for your kids. And if they're, and if that, and if they vary from those expectations, you are going to grieve the loss. Um, you don't have to tell that to your child, however. I don't think it's helpful to tell it to the child. I don't think it's a helpful thing to tell the to talk to the trans person about but it's a very helpful thing to talk to the parents about because it, it gives them a way of understanding right why they feel so sad even though their kid's still right there mm -hmm. yeah it makes me think of earlier um when dr minero was talking about having a separate space you know for parents really having their own container to kind of work through all of these things so that they can process, have have what they need, and then work through other types of issues with their children. Yeah. IPG yeah. Um, uh, years ago started running um, trans group for adolescents and a group for parents. Yeah, and and we did it for exactly that reason because parents need to be able to talk to other parents. That's why P flags a great resource. Yeah. So, we just have a couple minutes left, and I know your experience in this work um, is foundational to a lot of what we're talking about. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. I'm curious, I asked a, another speaker earlier, and, and especially you, just having been doing this work for so long, how have you remained sustainable in this work? Um, well, I said I'm an optimist. Um, that helps. Uh, also, I have to say, the changes, right? So I came out in 1975. The changes from 1975 to now, the positive changes have been so astronomical, more than I ever, I never dreamed that we would see gay marriage. Never dreamed that. So part of what sustains me is seeing that activism, it, we're making progress, right? And things are changing. So, and the other thing I got to say, you have to have colleagues that you can talk to and have, you know, 
working at, at IPG, um, and this is the reason why a lot of therapists want to work at IPG is you have colleagues you can share this one with and share the worries, the concerns, the anger, all of that stuff you can share. So make sure you have a peer support group that understands. Yeah, I love that. So reminding ourselves, especially in the midst of the political environment that you summarized today, um, that there has been been amazing progress because um, it can feel quite daunting without that perspective. And earlier we were talking about community care. So that seems to be a common thing that's emerging as well as folks needing to stay engaged in this difficult, sometimes difficult, but also really rewarding work. Right. Well, thank you, Dr. Nichols. We're so glad to have you. Thanks for your time today. Great. And uh, everyone else, we will be transitioning to lunch. So enjoy a 45 minute lunch if you'd like to in the chat. I noticed that a lot of folks were commenting on ways that um, small ways and big ways that you are making your LGBTQ, uh, your practices LGBTQ plus affirming. So if you want to, as a transition out to our lunch, if you drop something in the chat that you do to make your practice more affirming, we would love to hear it and share that knowledge in this community. Thanks everyone. See you after lunch. Thanks Dr. Nichols.